CVC, hello, welcome. Yeah, come on, Joelle, we got spots, we gotta get going. Awesome, all right, my name is Melissa Erickson. It is a pleasure to see all of you here with us and for everybody who is watching from online, thank you. We're really glad that you decided to spend your morning with us. Now, we have been uh, repeating a number kind of ad nauseum the past couple of weeks, months, and it may be the first number that you all memorize in like the past 10 years. I know it is for me. That is 440-276-5575. In today's fairly socially distanced way, we still want to interact with you, we want to talk to you, we want to be able to engage with you even when you aren't physically here. This number is how we are doing that. So throughout the service, Today, throughout, even throughout the rest of the week, you can go ahead and text that number. Um, and we actually have a real life staff person who is on the other end. So it's not just a robot giving you some auto responses. You will get to be interacting with one of us. So that number, save it in your phone. It's pretty great. And we're going to be giving you some keywords you can text to uh, help us figure out what it is that we, we're going to uh, minister with you. So uh, to start that off, if you are new or newer, if you're still trying to figure us out as a church, that's awesome. We're super glad that you're here. And one way that you can interact with us and just let us know that you're here is to text the keyword hello to that number and one of us will reach out to you we've even got a small gift to send your way just as a token of our appreciation if you are here in person and you are also new or again you're still feeling us out that's great and you want to talk to a real person we're going to have some awesome staff over at our guest connect table that's in the foyer on your way out say hi to them and again we've got a nice small little gift for you just to say hey we're glad that you're here and if you're in person and you don't want to talk to a real person because sometimes you it happens, guilty, uh, you can also text that number too. Also, for prayers or for getting in connection with a pastor, if you want to pray with somebody, if you need to talk through something, this text number is a great way to get that ball rolling. So you can text any of your prayer requests, and we'll get that sent out to our team. So text the keyword pray to that same number, or text the word connect to that number, and we'll get you in contact with one of our pastors. Last bit of housekeeping stuff uh, for all of you who are here in the room. Congratulations, you successfully signed up for service. Keep doing that. It's so helpful and it's awesome and it helps all of our new guests have spots. And if you are watching online and you're about trying to figure out, you know, I'm gonna come back to service, do I wanna try out the room? That's awesome. All that information is on our website, cbconline.org. It just got a facelift, so it also looks pretty great. Go ahead and figure it all out. Um, and just continue to sign up for your spot uh, for services by Saturday uh, before that Sunday. And if you're already like on the ball planning next week, you can sign up for next week's services already. It's pretty great. We've got two really awesome events that are coming up because sometimes events are still happening. One of them is an awesome service-oriented one that is our fall missions drive. One of our Big Ten ministry partnerships is called the Emergency Assistance Center, and they do some incredible work as a local food pantry that's just down the road. And they serve seven local zip codes for families in need. And they have been working, they work nonstop anyway, uh, but especially during the pandemic, they have been going nonstop and their shelves are pretty empty. And so we are focusing our entire fall missions drive to support the Emergency Assistance Center. So you can help out in one of two ways. Uh, if you're here in person or if you're watching online, if you wanna stop by the foyer sometime throughout the week, we've got some brown paper grocery bags with a shopping list. So you can just go and actually add some of those shopping items while you're out doing your own grocery shopping. Or you can donate directly to the Emergency Assistance Center on their website, which is lovelytcenter.org. It's a fun little combination there. Um, and it's that's our goal for the rest of this month. Uh, fun event, if you, well, that's that's also fun too, sorry, that's a uh, more actively engaged event. Uh, the CBC Kids Department is sponsoring, not just for kids, but for adults also, because we're also kids at heart, a road rally photo scavenger hunt Sunday, October 11th. So grab your family or grab your friend group, because that's the family that you choose, and sign up by emailing Denise P. Tech and meet at CBC. It ends at CBC. You're going to do a photo scavenger hunt in between, and there are prizes to give out for people who actually win or do, you know, whatever crazy things are going to happen. But everybody is a winner because there's also going to be a Barrio food truck. Everybody wins with Barrio and with cider and donuts and other fall delectables. So go ahead, sign up. It's going to be great. We can't wait to see you there. And with that, thank you again for joining us. And if you would, let's stand and worship. 
Thanks, Melissa. That was a lot of announcements. She got through it. That's good. All right, let's pray as we start. Oh, God, we want to set our hearts, our minds on you. Lord, there is a lot, a lot of noise, a lot of things happening around us that can distract us. Um, Lord, things outside of our control. But Lord, help us focus on you. Uh, Lord, as Peter was uh, out on the water with you, Jesus, and he started looking around, looking at the waves and looking at all the surroundings, and he got his eyes off of you, he started to sink. And I think you gave us that picture um, so that we would remember to keep our eyes on you, to keep our focus on you. Help us this morning, whether we're here in the room or in our homes, in our living rooms, um, Lord, help our attention, our hearts to settle onto you. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Dance in your freedom, awaken the light. 
bodies will fail, Lord, that we will physically die someday. But Jesus, you, the God of the impossible, the God that raises the dead, Lord, you're the one that our hope is in. And Lord, if you are for us, who can be against us, God? 
And Lord, if we want to see God-sized results, we can get on our knees, we can lift up our hands and say, God, we need you. And we can see you come through in ways that we can never do in our own strength. No man can do what you can do, God. And we praise you today. We give you glory today. Lord, our eyes are on you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you. Those of you who are here in the room, and great to see at least half your face, which is awesome. And uh, those of you online, so glad that you are here. We're together getting to share this moment. Uh, before I dive into the teaching time, just a couple things. If you are new or newer, uh, my name is Chad Allen. I'm one of the pastors on staff. We get to uh, teach today, which is great. And I just want to spend a few minutes really giving you a couple updates and encouragements before we get into our teaching time. The first I want to start with is something I shared a few weeks ago. Uh, starting this week, because of our partnership with one of our Big Ten ministries called True Freedom Ministries, uh, we're going to be taking one of our recent teaching series from this last year called Anxiety and the Peace of God. And it's going to be uh, played in 21 Ohio prisons. And so the reach is about 31,000 people, they estimate, by that happening. And so uh, there's not a lot of churches doing that, so we're very excited that uh, we're going to be able to put those uh, DVDs in the hand of True Freedom. They're going to get them into those prisons. And then uh, the message of hope in Christ, the new life in Christ, is going to be bouncing off the walls in 21 of the uh, state's prisons, which we're very excited about. And True Freedom will uh, field any responses to the gospel, requests for baptisms or other needs to come up and then invite us into that if there's a need for us to be involved. And we'll try it out for eight weeks and uh, reassess and see if that's something that is getting traction and is fruitful. And then we'll decide where to go from there. But that's a very exciting thing that'll be taking place. Also, last Thursday, October 1st, was a very significant day. Um, not only was it the 10-year anniversary for my family and I being here in Ohio, which is pretty cool, but also we now officially, formally, and legally uh, own two buildings as a church. We uh, took the gift that was offered by our friends over at First Baptist Church of Brunswick and signed all the paperwork. The title's been changed, and now uh, our Brunswick Strongsville campus has their on-site facility. It's official. So we're praising God for that. It's very cool. So the services won't begin until, you know, early next year because we've got some updating to do, but our missionary core team is still just praying over the area, working at engaging the community. Pastor Josh is over there this morning with them, uh, trying to make sure that they're just really getting traction in the community. That's our, that's our main focus. The building's a tool. We're going to leverage it and use it, but it's all about a community reaching a community. So just a couple of exciting updates. Also on teaching, starting next week, we're going to begin a new series called We the Church, and we're going to be going through the book of Titus for a couple months and really looking a little bit closer at the church, who we are, uh, how God has given us instructions to be structured and how to operate with our doctrine and, and our good works in the name of Christ and all those kinds of things. So it's going to be a really neat time for the next two months to look a little closer at who the church is, because we know that church is not a building, church is not a service, church is a community, and so we want to lean into that. Uh, in this fall. Also, I uh, just wanted to let you know that uh, as we're talking about gathering, I encourage all of you to take whatever your next step is to make sure you are gathering with other believers. And so those of you that are here in the room, uh, I've met people at every service, first time back in months, so congratulations for, for stepping out. But whatever uh, not being alone looks like, I highly encourage you to take the next step. So if you're home and you are 
uh, uh, vulnerable with health or you're with people who are vulnerable with health, what does not being alone look like? Maybe you can text friends and say, hey, we're going to watch the service together, watch with us and interact or you know, FaceTime or things like that. Maybe host a digital watch party or a physical watch party. Maybe it's time for you, if you're not going to be on site, to say, you know what, I'm going to invite a friend over, uh, maybe the one that I've been praying for, or a family member, or a couple from my life group, or my half of my life group, whatever it looks like, host a watch party, um, or maybe it's your time to come on site, just like, you know, get over the mask thing, the distancing thing, and just be like, I got to be with people, and show up. And so whatever the next step of being um, with others is, Take it. Do not be isolated. God did not want us to live in isolation. So just a few things before we dive in. Uh, I just want to remind you as well that all, all that I've talked about and all the things going on that I didn't get a chance to talk about that are uh, good, that are taking place right now, are happening because of you because of your faithfulness, because of your giving. So those DVDs are going out to true freedom because of your faithfulness here, your prayers, your serving, your giving. Um, the fact that we can do this service is because of your giving. Uh, the Brunswick campus is because of your giving and all the other ministries that are taking place. So thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, please have your giving moment uh, this week if you haven't already through your app or through online giving or reoccurring giving or drop it in the mail or on the boxes in the wall. But uh, make sure that uh, you join Hopefully, have an opportunity to continue to support the ministry here at CVC because things are happening because you guys are doing it. So thanks for that. Hey, let's pray, and then we'll dive into our teaching time. Well, Father, uh, we do want to give you glory, and we give you praise for every piece of good news that we were able to celebrate. Lord, we know there's a lot of other great things happening in our children's and youth and life groups and other areas. God, we thank you for that. God, um, it's because of the faithfulness of your people that can happen. So thank you for the faithful men and women, boys and girls at CVC who pray and who serve and who give here so that your work can be done. God, uh, we do pray for those uh, services that will be played over the next eight weeks in the 21 prisons in Ohio. God, would you use uh, our church to share the message of new life in Christ to those men and women? And may people be uh, coming to faith and baptized and to grow in their love for Christ while they're in the situation they're in. God, we continue to pray for the Brunswick and Strongsville campus that you continue to lead our team to uh, connect with the community and to utilize the resources that you clearly have made available for us on that. So thank you for that. And God, as we get ready to teach, we pray that you uh, prepare our hearts, our minds. God, we know there's a lot of distractions right now. There's a lot of tensions in the air right now in our nation. We pray for our nation. Father, uh, may our nation fall more and more in love with you. May you give our leaders wisdom. We pray for our national leaders. We pray for uh, our current president, especially with COVID-19. Pray that you give healing and health to him and his wife. And God, we pray for whoever's going to be our next president, that even now you will start to cultivate wisdom and, and a heart for you somehow, Lord, in that situation. So we want to be faithful to do what you've told us to, which is to pray for our leaders. So God, we pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders. Uh, God, thank you that we can trust you. You're in charge. You're sovereign over all things. And so lead us now as we dive into your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I absolutely love how God formed my family. Uh, we, we have the joy of having some diversity in our family, uh, but we're unified. So just in case uh, you may not be aware, um, I'm white, just in case you didn't know that. Okay, I'm white. Uh, my wife, Rika, who's actually sitting over here, she's, she's also white and beautiful, I might add, Okay. And then uh, our oldest son, who's currently uh, finishing up his last week of boot camp in the Army National Guard in Oklahoma, he's also white, but he's technically a quarter Mexican. You just would never know it, okay? And then my beautiful oldest daughter, Isabel, is a combination of African-American and white. And then our, my uh, young daughter, Faith, is Chinese. And so we, we have this beautiful blend of diversity in our family, but more importantly, we're one. We're, we're one group as we're the Allens. We're, the, we're united under the Allen family and our family unit. And so that's, that's a beautiful gift that God's given us. And, and I love how God has formed the global church. Like when you travel around the world, you've got people from every nation, tongue. You know, you've got, you've got this incredibly diverse group of people around the world that have a common love for Jesus. That when you encounter someone else from another place, if they love Jesus and you love Jesus, you're instantly family. And even though we might have some distinctions and differences on some of the, you know, non-fundamentals, um, we, we have this common love. And so I love how God has taken and made one group, the church, 
out of this very diverse uh, uh, grouping of people. And also, I love the diversity that God's given us here. You know, when you really start to talk to a lot of us that call CVC home, there's quite a bit of diversity even here in this church that God has given us. Uh, just some of the ones that off the top of my head, I know there's more, I'm not going to be able to name them all, but just the ones I remembered off the top of my head, I uh, know we've got people with African heritage, Scottish, Irish, Italian, Lebanese, German, Russian, Polish, Salvadorian, Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, Korean, Australian, Jewish, Canadian, Mexican, Brazilian, Indian, Middle Eastern, and, and many more. And so really, we do have quite a diverse church family, but what's more important is that we pursue oneness. Diversity is great, but the unity we have in the midst of our diversity is really the bullseye, it's the goal. And so God's given us this family that is uh, our one in Christ. And so when we start to think about the topic of racial unity, uh, we celebrate that as a church and we know that's part of God's heart. God has a heart for racial unity. It's important to him. It's part of his design. And to create a group of people from all over the world that can appreciate each other's different ethnic backgrounds and roots and cultures, yet prioritize our common faith in and worship of Jesus Christ as our Savior. But we know that the world, and we know that our pride, and we know that sin claws away at our racial unity. In fact, uh, we're living in a time where sometimes it feels like uh, we belong to the, the divided states, not the United States, right? And part of that's because of some of the racial tensions that we've been experiencing again in our nation. And I just want to say, as God's people, uh, we need to have a heart for racial unity because God has a heart for racial unity. And when it comes to racial reconciliation, racial injustice, and racial issues, the voice of Christians should be one of the loudest voices speaking to how to bring healing to that topic. And this is not a political issue. That's what we've been talking about for the last three weeks, and now uh, this, today will be four weeks. We're talking about... Uh, areas that we seem to be polarized that apparently are political issues, but when you start to dig into them as Christians and read Scripture, you realize these are biblical issues. These are topics close to God's heart. And so we've talked about the sanctity of human life. We've talked about economic justice. We've talked about biblical sexuality. Today we're going to talk about racial unity. And what our culture has done is tried to polarize us on these topics where we uh, severely disagree and, and start to have a major division in the body. And we've talked about now for three weeks how two of these topics seem to be favored by one of our major political parties in our country, and two of them uh, seem to be favored by the other major political um, you know, system in our uh, country. But in reality, they're not political issues. They're biblical issues. So therefore, if you put blue and red together, you get, you get purple. This, this is, this is all, these are all issues we should all have a heart on, that God speaks to in his word. And so we don't want to let the culture polarize us on issues that are important to God. And racial unity is one of those issues. Racial tensions um, are polarizing to people, even people in the church. And if you don't think that's true, then pay real close attention to what you're about to feel as I just say these words. When I say racism, white privilege, black lives matter, blue lives matter, all lives matter, critical race theory, white fragility. And imagine if I were to start to throw out particular names or if I were to start to use racial slurs. We become very aware that there are racial things happening inside of us that are triggered. And so we know that this is an issue that is real. Racial tension is very broad. It's a very far-reaching topic, and it's absolutely tragic, and it's sinful that it's hindering God's people from advancing God's mission to make more disciples. And so we're going to look at that a little closer today. Um, uh, and, and I just want to let you know that ethnic diversity and, and unity in the midst of diversity and racial tensions are not new to the church. This is not something that just came online, right? We know that this is a historical issue. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today because it is something we believe is on the heart of God. And what we're going to do is I want to take uh, some time today and look at the early church. And the reason I want to do that is because the early church was familiar with 
tensions that revolved around ethnic issues and cultural issues. And so I invite you uh, to open your Bibles. Now we're going to be in a couple different passages today. Open up your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 2. And as you're turning there, I just want to talk a little bit about, about the inception of the church. Uh, if, you, if you look at the biblical narrative, uh, you see where Jesus came, was identified as the Messiah of all people, the Jewish Messiah that we were waiting for. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross in our place. He died for the sins of humanity. He died in our place to take upon himself our sins that create a barrier between us and God. And then he was buried. He rose three days later. He, he walked around for 40 days, appearing to you know, uh, his followers to prove that he was alive. And then he ascended to heaven. And then what he told the disciples at the time, and there was a specific group, 120 of them, and this is including the original you know, um, 11 apostles out of 12 because Judas um, took his life. We have 11 of the original 12 apostles. We've got uh, a group of 120 people now that Jesus told to go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. And so days later, the Holy Spirit of God comes to this 120 people waiting in a room and he fills them and empowers them and they leave that room and now they're in a very well-crowded Jerusalem. They are not practicing safe distancing at this point in Jerusalem, right? Okay, and Very crowded because they're all there for Pentecost. They're there to worship. They're there to celebrate. And so they go out, miraculously filled by the Holy Spirit, speaking languages they do not know, proclaiming the story of Christ and proclaiming God. And so that's where we pick up because I want you to see something about the inception of the church. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 5. Reading from there, here's what we see. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Right? Verse 6. And at this sound of the Holy Spirit, and the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language, all the, all the disciples. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? You know, from the region of Galilee. They shouldn't know these languages. And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and uh, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, that means converts, right, to Judaism, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. If you put your ethnic lens over that passage, what was the ethnicity of the early church based on this passage? It was multi-ethnic. It was very multi-ethnic. And, and so here's just a little bit more on that. So what happened was in the 8th century, there was the Assyrian exile, the Jewish people. They were scattered. They went everywhere, okay? And then in the 6th century, there was the Babylonian exile, and they were scattered again and went everywhere. And then here's what happens. They, they ended up living and rooting in all these other cultures and communities. And then they were called back. They would come back to worship at the temple in Jerusalem from all these different countries. And so you would have Jews from all over. Like, look at these four pictures. Okay, pop quiz. Which one of these people are Jewish? They all are. All those, all those people in those pictures are Jewish. It took me some time to find some online, but I found them, you know, because I wanted to find good pictures. There, there's a very diverse representation. And so you had this diverse representation show up. In fact, if you look at this map and understand what happened there on the day of Pentecost in Acts, you had people from all over converging on Jerusalem, and then the Holy Spirit comes, and these people are converted, and now you have a very multi-ethnic church from its inception. See, the problem is we sometimes like we, we look back in our mind's eye at the church and we think very homogenous. Probably all look the same, sounded the same, talked the same. No, they, there was a lot of diversity there. And now that they were followers of Christ, more importantly than the diversity, now there's going to be unity. They're going to come together as one in Christ. And so that's, that's the inception of the early church. Now, the early church didn't have it easy. Like when you read Acts chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right, what you see on the good side is more and more people are coming to faith in Christ. The church is growing, okay? 
You're also going to see that they're developing this incredible bond of unity. And they're taking care of each other's needs. They're distributing, make sure everyone has their needs taken care of. But on the other side, the flip side, they're, in, they're encountering some troubles. There's persecution. And so some of them are getting arrested. They're being threatened. Their lives are being threatened. Um, it's not easy to be a new follower of Christ in the early church. And then, and this is where I want to take us, then we had our first written account of internal conflict with the church. I don't know if you know this, but sometimes people in churches don't agree, okay? Just in case you didn't know that. And now what we see is we see the first recorded conflict of the early church in Acts chapter 6. Turn there with me, Acts chapter 6. Open up your Bibles, get in your Bible apps, look at Acts chapter 6. We're going to look at the first internal conflict of the church, and guess what? You know what sparked? Do you know what was at the roots of the first internal conflict of the very first church? Ethnic tension. From the beginning. It was the very first tension point in the early church. It was an ethnic and cultural tension point. So let's find ourselves in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. It says, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, we'll talk about them in a minute, arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Let's stop there. Uh, we know that poverty is a killer. We know that poverty is, is, is a, a detrimental, tragic um, uh, place to be in. But even more so in the ancient days, if you were a widow, one of the most vulnerable in the population because of the way the culture works. So if, if a woman's husband died, and a lot of times they died young, okay, uh, accident, sickness, whatever, uh, war, <laughs> so they, they died young, then, then the, the sons, if she had any, would be responsible for taking care of her. If not, family members. But if a widow didn't have family, or some people don't realize that if a, if a widow came to faith in Christ, she decided to follow Jesus as the Messiah, but her family were very devout Jews and did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah, she could actually be kind of banished from the family and persecuted, and they wouldn't take care of her. And so now you, you, you have uh, these widows in the community of the church and this group called the Hellenists are going like, hey, ours aren't being taken care of. They're being overlooked, all right? That's what's going on here. Look at verse two. And so the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples. So we have the original 11 disciples plus now a new guy, Matthias, who's replaced J Judas. They summoned the full number of the disciples, said it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, and whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch, these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. I just want to elaborate. I just want to review and elaborate a little bit of what we're seeing here, and then try to learn a few lessons from the early church for, I think, um, ways we can handle today the same issue. So the first thing we see is this. The first observation is that the church is faithfully on mission. The church is faithfully on mission. People are coming to Christ, and the church is growing. And now we see this complaint is raised. Now, it says it was an accusation. It was this complaint. It didn't say that it was valid. It just said it was a complaint. Now, we have no reason to believe it was invalid because they responded and went after the need. But now there's this complaint. There's this accusation. But either way, what we see here is the Hellenists were not happy with the Hebrew believers. And this right here is a complaint of discrimination. It's a complaint of being overlooked, a lack of equality, a lack of justice. And, and I'm not trying to be funny here, but if we were to contextualize this a little bit, what it would probably be like is the Hellenists were saying, hey, look, we've got to talk about Hebrew privilege because the Hebrew widows are getting something the Hellenistic ones are not. Maybe they would write a campaign, you know, uh, Greek widows matter, you know, something like that. Like this really bothered them. So let's talk about the Hellenists. The Hellenists were believers in Christ that came from outside of the Judean area and would have spoke Greek and probably their native tongue. So they're, they're Hellenistic. They're Greek in their culture. 
their Greek in their language, and so they would think Greek, act Greeks, you know, all those kinds of things, yet still were Jewish by, by heritage and maybe by faith as well. And so they, they had come to Jerusalem, they got converted at Pentecost, but they were from outside the area. So they would look different, sound different, different, you know, skin colors, different languages. These are the Hellenists. Now, sometimes there would be Jews in Jerusalem that would, would become Hellenistic because they just liked the appeal of the Jewish culture. But most of these would have been from outside of the area, Hellenistic Jews that now were believers. And then there were the Hebrews. These were believers who were native Jews, and they're very Hebraic. They would speak Hebrew or the more dominant Semitic language of the time was Aramaic. They would have spoke Aramaic and Hebrew, and uh, they would look Hebrew. They would eat Hebrew and all their things, even though now they're converted to Christ and trying to figure out the Jew-Gentile tension that we see play out all the way through the New Testament. And now what we see is, you know, this group is Hebraic. They want, they actually resist Greek thinking and culture. They want to preserve the Hebraic culture, and there's conflict between the Hellenist and the Hebrews now. So you see where this is going, right? Like the writing is kind of on the wall, like what's about to happen with all the dynamics. And you can see the similarities to today. Now this is not direct racism. This isn't a clear like, I see myself as more you know, superior than you necessarily. This is not direct racism, but it's an ethnic and cultural tension that's a threat to the oneness of the church. Now, the leaders in the early church could have dismissed it. They could have ignored it. They could have said, well, hey, that's your problem. They could have got defensive and said, well, 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 here's why we're doing that, or you don't know what you're talking about. They could have started becoming angry or ir irritated and starting to you know, go back and forth and be hateful. There's a lot of ways this could have gone down, but look what they did. They listened, received the complaint, and responded and tried to take care of it. Now notice, there is one uh, very important distinction I want to stand out here that I think is, that, that, that should stand out for us is they said here in this passage that they did not want to neglect the preaching of the word and prayer to serve tables. This is not a, um, hey, we're so good, we can't help serve statement. This was a realization that the primary leaders of the church needed to make sure that they weren't diverting a bunch of energy into caring for a lot of the needs that were there, but instead make sure the energy was focused on the preaching of God's word and prayer. And so they wanted to not neglect the main mission of the church. They wanted to make sure that they were being faithful to proclaim God's word and to pray. And so that was the greatest priority, yet they still wanted to make sure the need was being taken care of. They didn't dismiss the need. And so look how they handled it. They gathered the church together. They cast vision. Uh, the church took one big step forward in unity. It all sounded good. And then they raised up leadership to take care of the need. And not just any leaders. Did you notice uh, the description of the leaders? It wasn't like, oh, they're gifted to do this. Oh, they're really talented in distributing. They have great organizational skills. No, it was about character and spiritual maturity and a good reputation there was a filling of the Spirit. These were very spiritual people that they wanted to put in place. And so uh, they took them, and notice this, they took them from the underrepresented group. If you review the names in Acts 6-5, you look at Stephen and, and all these other names that you see in there, those are Hellenistic names. They're actually not Hebrew names. And so they took the group that was feeling the way they were feeling, and they invested in them. And they uh, delegated great leadership to them and increased the diversity in the early church among those who had roles of responsibility. And now the perceived oppressor uh, really empowered those who were feeling uh, oppressed. And so this was, this was a beautiful gift that we see to the church because it kept the unity where it needed to be. It increased diversity, but more so it helped with the unity. And what was the result what was the result of this? Look at verse 7 again. The word of God continued to increase. The number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And even a great many of the priests came obedient to the faith. The reason they said that is because converting a Jewish priest in Jerusalem was a tough nut to crack, right? But even these uh, men of faith were coming to Christ um, and having faith in Christ. And so this issue 
of the Hellenistic widows being overlooked was steeped in ethnic and cultural tension. And it was the first internal threat to the unity of the church. But God gave the church courage. He gave them wisdom and love to dodge that bullet. You know, we've drifted so far from that today, haven't we? When we look at the church in our country, we look at what's gone on in our church for, for centuries, really, we've allowed racial disunity to disrupt the body of Christ. But here's the good news. The battle's not over. <laughs> there's still a lot of ground that we can take, and there's repair and healing that can be done in the name of Jesus as God continues to build a diverse and unified body to proclaim him and glorify him. So that's what we see when we look over the situation. But what are a few lessons that we can take and apply from this? The first is we also need to individually and collectively prioritize the mission that Jesus gave the church, which is to make disciples of Jesus who will make disciples of Jesus who will make disciples of Jesus. See, the church was faithful to prioritize the preaching of God's word and prayer. And as they did that, the church grew. So God's word, was kept, uh, God's word kept going out and new believers kept coming in. That's what was taking place. And so in the same way, I think we need to make sure that we continue to prioritize the proclaiming of God's word and prayer. And if I could just be really transparent, like one of the hardest things about pastoring is that a lot of people like to write your job description for you, and then they like to put a couple of addendums on how you should do your job. This is, this is how you need to pastor. Now, there's obviously good collective insight and wisdom that comes from the body, but I'm just going to tell you right now, when you think about the levels of disruption and discouragement and disagreement that happen in the church, and even good distractions, like great ideas, great things to do, you feel the pull as a pastor. As a pastor, you feel the pull away from the proclaiming of God's word and prayer because you start to do a lot of other things. Sometimes it's putting out fires. Sometimes it's, you know, chasing some great ideas. And so what I guess I'm asking you is, will you be faithful to pray for pastors? Pray for me. Pray for the pastors in our church. Pray for the pastors you know. Pray for pastors you don't know. As you're driving by a church, it's like, I'm going to pray for that pastor, whoever's leading that church. God, would you give that person wisdom? Would you help them to be faithful for the proclaiming of God's word, that they'd be faithful in prayer? Like, we've got to keep the mission that Christ died for as our highest priority as a family. But also, this trickles down, I think, to us as individuals as well. We've got to keep the priority of God's mission. That which Jesus died for, rose for. That has to be number one for us. And so I think on a practical level, that means if you are more concerned about who's sitting in that Oval Office in four weeks than you are about lost people, you've drifted from the mission of Christ. That's not why Jesus died. That's not why he rose, okay? If you find yourself conversing more, talking more, posting more about your political views and opinions than you do in proclaiming the gospel that saved our souls, then you have actually drifted from the mission, See, see, Jesus didn't die for racial unity. But we can pursue racial unity because Jesus died. And so we want to make sure that we keep the mission as the main priority and not get pulled in by the culture. The culture wants to lure us in and disorient us and disable us. And you'll use racial tensions to do it. And so we don't want to, to find ourselves in that place. And I would just say, maybe if we'd be more proactive in the mission of Christ, we would see the church growing in America right now, not shrinking. The second observation, I think, is this. You know, there was a complaint and an accusation that was raised in the church. It was one of preferential treatment. It was one of discrimination and inequality. Um, but the church just responded. The church, I believe, prayed, and it just it came together, and it responded to the complaint. You know, we are not going to fix in a few minutes what took, you know, hundreds of years to break. But we, we need to all make sure we're on the same page. Racism is real. Racism is not a myth. Racism is not something that, like, oh, they talk about it or they make it up. Racism is a real situation. There are people that are being treated differently because of the color of their skin, their accents, the shape of their eyes, um, whatever it is, their, their ethnic background. It's very real. And the church is not immune. I could tell you multiple stories of things that have happened in just in several years of how people have encountered racism even within the walls of CVC. And so we got to make sure that because of our mutual love for Jesus and our dedication to unity in Christ, 
We don't allow racial disunity to take root in the church family. And so we have to make sure that we are proactive of that. You know, some of you are probably, um, as, as I talk about this, and I think a lot of times when we talk about this, where a lot of people struggle is they say, but I don't, I'm not a racist. I don't feel racist. I don't, I don't use racial slurs. I don't have any hate in my heart for people who are different. But, but I think this is where we need to grow in our maturity. Like, for example, we know that poverty is real. Now, now, maybe you've never encountered true poverty, but that doesn't mean it's not real, and that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be doing something to help people who are in poverty, right? That's, that's what we're supposed to do as followers of Christ, right? Uh, in the name of Christ to help people in poverty. Maybe you don't know anyone who's ever gotten an abortion, okay? But that doesn't make abortion not real. And that doesn't mean that we're not to, av- not, not to advocate for the unborn or try to bring healing to the women who are suffering because they've had abortions. No, we're, we're called to step into that. So in the same way, just because uh, you have never, you know, felt racist or experienced racism in some sense doesn't mean racism's not real and that we shouldn't be advocating and moving toward racial unity. Oh, quick poll. I know there's a bunch of you online. I'd love to see your hands, but I, just, I can only see these in the room for now. How many of you, raise your hand, quick poll, how many of you have personally observed, witnessed, or experienced racism in any way, shape, or form? Absolutely, most of our hands. Absolutely, most of our hands. But here's what's crazy. I'm finding people are going, I'm, I'm going to believe this blog, this video, this post, or whatever from this stranger that I've never met, some anonymous person, rather than the person in my church who raises their hands and says, but I've seen it, I've experienced it, I, it's real. And so we, we need to understand that it's real. Now, it's not our main mission, but it's part of who we are as we live out our faith in Christ. And so our history as a nation has dug this hole of slavery and racism. And we all live in it now. And so really, honestly, as followers of Christ, we should be at the, lead, the leaders of the pack trying to bring healing out of that hole, even if we've never personally contributed. We don't want to be apathetic, complicit. We don't want to be aggressive or agitating as well. And so God's called us and equipped us to make a difference. You know, if, if, if this is an issue or an area that you don't feel well read on or informed on, um, two, two recommends for you. One, just start to have conversations with people that are different than you. We talk about this all the time, right? If you don't have friends of, of, that are colored, talk to them. Like, get together with people with different ethnic backgrounds and, and have conversations about this topic and learn from one another. Uh, a great little book. If you want to start somewhere, just like a, a simple read that's got some depth to it, I highly recommend this little book. It's called Advocates. It's written by a pastor named Dottie Lewis. He's also the vice president of North American Mission Board's SEND Network. Uh, our, our founding pastor, Rick Duncan, works with Sin Network, and this is a great little book. Dottie Lewis is not only a pastor and is an African-American man, but he's also married to a Caucasian woman. So he, he's got a lot to say on this, and it's a small read, but it's, it's a really good read. And I love one of the things that he said in this book. He said, when our heart's posture is divisive, or when we stand idly by in the midst of division, we are in opposition to God's mission. Racial division aren't simply a social issue reserved for politicians or civic leaders to handle. This is a spiritual and moral problem. So this is not a political issue. It's a biblical issue. And because we're biblical people, it's going to touch our lives. We're going to try to be advocates for um, racial unity. And so I think we need to do what the early church did. Listen to the complaints and, and respond appropriately to see how we can be a healing agent where some people are hurting on this issue. The last thing I think is so important to talk about is is this whole understanding of God has a heart for racial unity. We see evidence in these passages that we've read. When you read the Bible, passage after passage after passage, you'll see God has a heart for not just racial diversity, but racial unity in the midst of that diversity. But I just want to focus on one passage because looking back at the inception of the church, I think it's helpful for us here in 2020. But also I think looking forward, they're like, okay, what's God's plan? Where's he going with this? I think it's so important to look at the future. So I invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 7. And if you're not familiar with the book of Revelation, God took a man named the Apostle John and gave him a glimpse of heaven, gave him a little peek into the future, okay? And here's what John captures. Here's one of many things that John captures as God is giving him this uh, special sneak peek. In Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 11, here's what we see. John says, After this I looked, 
And behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's our future. God is so committed and so in love with diversity and unity that he's going to fill heaven with it. That as far as the eye can see, you're going to see people of every possible ethnic background. The diversity is going to be crazy, but then there's going to be this incredible unity that all, we're all going to worship the Lord together as one. And this isn't something that God says, oh, by the way, that's for the future. You'll see it someday. He wants us to get glimpses of it now as we worship him here, leaning into that time. I'll never forget, I know, Ricky, you won't forget either. Uh, we went to a conference years ago called Urbana. And it was kind of like the Super Bowl of missions conferences. There was about 20,000 people there. And they put us in this round, we, we met in this round, uh, uh, um, uh, I don't want to say auditorium because that's so small, but it was around, um, what's the word? Arena. arena, thank you, thank you. It was around arena, okay? There's 20,000 of us. And you look around, there's people from all over the world. And the team that was leading us in teaching and worship music was just this multi-ethnic team. We sang in English and Spanish and languages I don't even know, right? Which is funny because there were times we were singing, I'm like, I have no clue what that word means, but I understand it. <laughs> and in that moment, like that, that was just imprinted like on my mind, my heart, my, my, my soul. Like this was a taste. This was a glimpse of heaven. It's, it's never left me. It's never left me. It's been over 20 years. And see, that, that's God's heart. And knowing that's where God's taking us means we're not going to be inactive and apathetic or adversarial now. This is a biblical issue. God has a heart for racial unity. So yes, I love that my family is diverse and that we're one as the Allens. I love that the global body of Christ is diverse, but that we're one as believers, I love the diversity that exists in this church, and I believe God is continuing to grow in this church. But may the, may the unity, not just the diversity, but the unity grow as well. I want to leave you with a reflection question. Because I don't want you just to come here or watch and then just turn this off or walk out and, and you, you, just, you leave this moment. So in your journals, in your phone, write the answer to this question. What is one way that you could pursue and preserve racial unity. And if you don't have the answer now, like, like bookmark it and make sure you get back to it in a little bit, sometime today. Like what is the Holy Spirit putting on your heart? What's one way that you can pursue racial unity and preserve it and protect it? And so maybe it's a conversation you can have. Maybe it's information you can read. Maybe it's um, an apology you need to make. Whatever it is, like be obedient to what the Holy Spirit puts on your heart. Also, I want to give you a chance to respond to anything you've heard today. And so I'm going to come back to our response number, that 440-276-5575 number. If, 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 if at the end of the day, all this conversation, uh, someone watching right now or someone here realizes like this conversation about Jesus is very important and, and you want to have a conversation about Jesus, we'd love to talk to you about Jesus. So text the word Jesus to that number and we'd love to tell you more about what it means to be a follower of Christ. Or maybe you just want to connect with a pastor, a ministry leader, and, and really interact or dialogue about this topic that we've talked about. Text the word connect, and we can have a conversation about this. But I also want to give you something. And so if you get your phone out right now, and you type the word unity, okay, so text that word unity to that number, here's what you're going to get for the next week. You're going to get a passage, a Bible passage each day, and a prayer prompt, right? We've, we've been doing this more. So many of you have said this has been so helpful to you. And so uh, every day this week, you'll get a, a passage that speaks to our oneness in Christ, especially when it comes uh, to the racial unity. And you'll get a prayer prompt to go with that to keep you thinking, praying, and processing throughout the whole week on this topic. And hopefully this will cement some things into you as you move forward. And so with that, let's pray together. And then um, we're going to make sure that we try to act upon whatever the Holy Spirit puts in our hearts. Let's pray. Father, you are a God who in your wisdom and your sovereignty created diversity. 
God, we are so grateful that people aren't the same. Taller, shorter, wider, thinner, different colors, different accents. Lord, uh, you are a rich God with, with so much substance to who you are, and you've reflected your diverseness. You've reflected your depth of substance by creating the diverse cross-section of humanity and then supernaturally bringing us together to make one, one people group, a church. So, Father, we confess and we're so sorry for our attitudes that have gone against that. Maybe it's been our apathy. We've been passive. Maybe we've had racial biases in our heart. This has been an issue where, where we've violated and hurt others because of it. Wherever we've gone off target from your heart, would you realign us back to your heart today? And God, we pray that that would be true for all the issues we've talked about this month. God, may us being aligned with these issues of your heart when it comes to the sanctity of human life, social, economic justice, biblical sexuality, and now racial unity. God, align us with who you are and what your heart beats for. We ask in Jesus' name. We all sit together. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's profess our faith together. This is something that we can, in confidence, declare. And regardless of culture, regardless of our of race, of ethnicity, we come as one, believing in the gospel, believing in Jesus Christ. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, and through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior, I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus.
Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. caught up in the little things that that don't matter as much and this is what matters you know we believe in Jesus Christ and so I would just encourage you guys you know to keep seeking the Lord Uh, we got to stay in community we can't um, get isolated during this time there's different ways to do that within our life groups it's probably the best way stay connected to your life groups if you're not in a group Get in a group uh, because we are the church. And it's not just about right now, Sunday morning. It's throughout the week and it's in fellowship and in community with one another. Um, So I would encourage you towards that end. Um, You guys can be seated. I want to invite the ushers to come forward and they're going to uh, dismiss you by row. And we're so glad that you could be here with us today.